one of the big things that I always wished, again, with the benefit of hindsight and all that, um, I always wished that the Remain campaign in 2016 had pushed the fact that, you know, if we leave, there are going to be very, very big consequences for your holidays and your travels if you want to go to Europe in the future. And I always think, you know, as we see now, the big passport queues, if you've been one, if you've been to Europe in the past couple of years, uh, you know in the queues, you can hear people in the queues complaining about having to wait in the queues, watching other people go through the EU queue, just, you know, straight through. And again, depending on what time your flights and stuff like that, those queues can be quite long. You know, <laughs> I was one in... Um, Oh, was it Romania where we were like having to like stamp things constantly? We were there for like, you know, 30 minutes just having to wait because they only had two people on. And yet it wasn't just us. There were other people from international countries having to use that very same system as well. So it has increased the queues, especially, you know, in places like that. We would not be surprised if that's the same everywhere in a lot of other European airports. Um, when I used the Eurostar, uh, the queue that you just have to go through 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 Houston, and if you've traveled through, um, not Houston, um, St. Pancras, sorry, if you've been through St. Pancras Station, and you know, especially if you come off the trains from the north from Sheffield, you will go down that escalator, and you just have to take a look to your to your left, and you can see the queues that that are just forming way way back, and that is the Eurostar queue. And that has been a constant problem that, that even Eurostar constantly bring up that even if they were going to bring in the, well, as we just said, the EU entry exit system where they are now going to ask for fingerprints and, of course, retinal scans uh, on top of showing uh, passport documentation, you know, going to be increasing those wait times even longer. And, of course, that will also apply for, for lorry drivers as well. So these wait times, and I think a lot of this stuff, really, if we do sort of, you know, have a rejoin campaign, well, yeah, um, definitely a benefit we need to push, you know, definitely a benefit we need to push uh, on rejoining the EU that we can finally get rid of those queues. You know, we can return to what we used to have, which everyone used to enjoy. And like I say, if you've been in one of these queues, if you've been on holiday to Europe, you know the conversations. You've heard the conversations about waiting in that queue. No one likes to have to do it, but you know the conversations that I had. And yet, you know, we did warn people back in the back when that was going to be a consequence. And of course, now with the EU entry exit system, those queues could become even worse. They could become even longer. And I don't think British holidaymakers are really going to. Uh, sort of appreciate having to wait in that queue and of course again that will definitely help you know we should we say change people's minds on uh, on the eu if if not already i guarantee you it has uh fundamentally changed people's minds now having to wait in queues um definitely definitely so but anyway going on to this because a dover council leader was at a house of lords meeting and he was talking about uh, how he was basically thanking, you know, the fact that the EU have gotten rid, well, not permanently, but there was going to be the inter EU entry exit system that was going to come into force. Instead, they pulled it back and have now decided to go for a phased introduction. But even because they're doing that phased introduction, this council leader was like, well, it's still going to be a disaster. Things are still not ready. Things are still not in place. And yet, we've had years to get this stuff ready and in place. What was all this stuff that the government, the last government, bear in mind, was pumping out continuously about getting prepared for Brexit, getting all this stuff? They didn't do any of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, it Honestly, it boggles the mind. It boggles the mind on what they were really doing. It, it boggles the mind. But Anyway, 
back onto this. But before we do go on to this, uh, please do remember to click on the like, share, and subscribe button. And of course, down below, there are links to the Patreon page, the one off the nation link called Buy Me Coffee, where you can well buy me coffee, the YouTube thank you button. And of course, as always, there's the Pony Club down below as well. So let's get on to this. So EU entry exit system would have been a complete and utter carnage, says Dover Council leader. So the planned uh, November 10th introduction of the EU's now postponed any EU entry exit system. Hang on, let's get rid of that Kimmy Badnock advert. There we go. <laughs> um, the planned um, postponed uh, EU entry system, exit system would have been an absolute, complete and utter carnage, according to the leader of the Dover District Council. Kevin Mills, a councillor, was speaking at a very special session of the House of Lords, Justice and Home Affairs Committee, following last week's postponement of the postponement of the entry exit system of the EES. With just a month to go, interior ministers decide to postpone the introduction indefinitely and then apply a staged approach. Mills said that none of the infrastructure is ready. None of the IT is ready. It would have been complete and utter carnage, and we are more than happy that there has been a delay without the ESSS. And we'll now see the town come to a complete gridlock several times a year. You add this on and it's gridlock now on steroids. That is what concerns us. And bear in mind, he's bringing this up. Gridlock now several times a year. Why is that happening? That is happening because of the delays at the ports, the tailbacks that this is causing, the queues. And that's just over. You know? <laughs> so, he continues to say, if the Department for Transport are, of course, still saying that they expect up to 14-hour delays if there's a problem somewhere that obviously needs to be addressed. In Dover, that's not just the A20. The whole town stops. Nothing moves. You see ambulances stuck in queues everywhere suffers. If we don't get this right, we're in a backlog. And then it backs up now into the rest of Kent. I cannot over-exaggerate the damage this does business-wise to the community, to individuals, to the security of, of course, the country, because staff can't even get to work to actually secure the borders. That's our problem. And bear in mind, we don't have this problem if we're in the Single Market and Customs Union. We don't have this problem if we're in the EU, once again, selling this benefit of this is this is this is a result of what you actually voted for. Because I, Kent was, I think, vast majority um, voted to leave. They're now having to deal with the consequences of this. Very, very, very much so. So at this very same session, and this gets onto the Eurotunnel stuff. A senior Eurotunnel official said that the company was now ready. And the decision to postpone it would have cost it money after installing all the equipment at the Folkestone terminal. Geoff Keefe, the chief corporate public affairs of the uh, of the Europeans um, of Eurotunnel's parent group, uh, Getlink Group, said to the committee, "We're disappointed that it's been delayed. We were ready. We had all the technology in place, our infrastructure in place. We'd recruited most of the staff. The staff will not, of course, be laid off." but it will be kept on on a range of roles. The investment so far totals over £70 million. And we were looking forward to at least starting to recover that cost, Mr. Keith said. All of that will now have to be put into hibernation, a cost that will now inevitably now be passed on to the consumer. He hinted that Eurotunnel may now seek compensation from the EU. We are, of course, considering the cost recovery. We have now followed their project to the letter. To see the cost just now sitting there, this is not an acceptable solution for a publicly quoted company. Uh, we had, of course, we known that there would be a delay. We could have at least reprogrammed, of course, our recruitment. We would have at least mitigated part of the cost. So you've got to remember Eurotunnel operates in the UK you know, uh, and the EU. They sort of knew this was coming. They were at least vastly more prepared uh, than you can see the port of Dover was at least prepared. Um, but now they're having to go to the EU saying, well, because of your delay, we now need, you know, compensation from you. <laughs> so, but again, that was because of what the EU did um, 
more so than anything. But like I say, the Euro Eurostar was ready. You, you know, well, Eurotunnel was ready. Eurostar, of course, again, different company. Eurostar, which has also now just proposed border controls, uh, sent Pancras International, so it was also ready for the November 10th start too. Uh, Gareth Williams, the Eurostar uh, General Secretary, said, uh, we will sit there with now high investment in infrastructure that is now idle. What lies behind these latest delays and weaknesses of the test environment did not give the member states the kind of confidence that we will all know now is necessary. All the systems will now communicate properly and will be at least robust and reliable. Keith, of course, speculated that the extra time could be used to devise at least a system more suited now to passengers in the cars, he said. The ECS is designed now for an airport environment where people are, of course, all indoors, well lit and weather protected, comfortable spaces, environments with plenty of time. Our model is, of course, a very high density vehicle based system. So people are now sitting in metal boxes and we have that very same level of biometric data from them sitting in the car as you would with any individual passenger on foot or in an airport. There's a lot of work going on and the improvement now to try and capture the sophisticated or even facial biometric data we believe is just a way of capturing fingerprints and biometrics at a distance. We hope that can we engage with the EU to bring these things forward, to make the most of this delay and even bringing in better systems into place. So that is at least good that Eurostar is saying, well, okay, there has been a delay, but we're going to at least use this delay to try and improve the systems. But again, Systems we wouldn't need, of course, well, for obvious reasons, but yeah, you know, there you go. Um, so we know, of course, that other countries it is now cost possible to capture your facial facial biometric data in your car on the way to the border. Keith later said that it would, of course, be most unwelcome if the UK's ETA, due to go live on all European visitors in April, will conclude with the co uh, commencement of the entry and exit system by the EU. The London South End Airport spent even now further confusion by claiming that the online uh, passengers heading for Europe in the summer of 2025 would need an ETAS permit. The airport is, of course, telling passengers online the ETAS, the European Travel Information Authorization System, is a visa, visa waiver system that will apply to UK citizens from mid-2025. But the postponement of the entry-exit system now means that it is now certain that British travellers to Europe will not need an ETAS, and it will start a minimum of at least six months after the ECS is working well. And of course, there initially, there will be, of course, a six-month grace period in which it will be optional. The very earliest that the ETAS could be mandatory is summer of 2026, although the start date is likely to be later. So. There you go. Um, travel chaos, basically, a result of that. And we said this, you know, there would be travel chaos. I think it should have been used more. You know, this is what will happen. You know, it would be interesting to see the Brexiteers try to explain that. But travel and the holiday travel never really was a big factor of the 2016 referendum. It was not uh, talked about at all. Mainly, of course, it came down to the ideas of talking about trade, um, you know, sovereignty, and of course, immigration. Bear in mind, the big Brexit blob could be about anything you particularly wanted to, and that's about the way that the Brexit has used it. And of course, of course, we always, always remember that Daniel Hanan infamously said, again, on Sky News, you can go watch it yourself, you're going to vote for leave was not for leaving the single market and customs union, because only a fool would leave the single market and customs union. And as far as I'm concerned, any future government could rejoin uh, the EU and single market based on that. Now, of course, it would be um, spark absolute consternation from the Brexiteers, but it would be funny to use that argument against them, <laughs> just to see them absolutely start spinning in their <laughs> in their wheels uh, on that. But you know, we'll see. Of course, is what happens. But we know we know the polls. We know uh, feelings have drastically changed, even more quicker than people first anticipated. People still thought we would not be at this point uh, where we were. So things are moving. I think a lot quicker. I think that Labour, even though it's in its first term, fundamentally, I think it's going to have to sort of rethink 
what it wants and what it does with the EU. We've seen the sort of EU reset put forward by Keir Starmer, which has been good. Fundamentally, resetting the relations with the EU has been good. There's a lot more stuff planned about, you know, doing sort of more of these deals with the EU. We've seen Germany very, very ambitious about what it wants to do uh, with that. Uh, we've seen more and more, you know, uh, reciprocal things that the EU has said, you know, sort of, you know, um, you know youth movement scheme, which again, would benefit the UK massively um, for, you know, re, re, you know, for a lot of like return stuff. Uh, but this is, you know, modern trade, you know, this is how modern, um, you know, international agreements work. It's pre quo quo. You do something, we'll give you something in return. Um, that's just how modern agreements really work these days. Uh, but we are seeing, I think, a lot of good work. There's been a lot of at least better movement on this. I think the EU has recognized that this Labour government is certainly going to be a lot better partner than you know the previous administration. Uh, that certainly sets good groundwork for future talks and things like that. So uh, we'll see what happens. But overwhelmingly, as I said before, I'm very happy with the work that Keir Starmer has done, sort of resetting this. I think that maybe you know we haven't had a lot of so far you know, stuff said, but you never know. And I think having better relations, fundamentally, that is a lot better. And I think people really underestimate why having good relations is a lot better than at least the relations we did have uh, for a lot of other reasons. But, you know, we'll continue watching what happens here. I think the, the EU fundamental reset has been good. Um, you know, talks are continuing. I think there's something happening. I think... Um, in the next couple of weeks, maybe even months, uh, on this topic and subject. So we'll see what happens. But as always, I think you know, Labour sort of doing this stuff is good fundamentally. It has really been needed to sort of happen. Um, but of course, as always, let me know what you think down below. And of course, we'll see you all next time.